Welcome to Unscripted Faith. I'm Angela Madden, and you may notice our co-host, Jay Anthony Gilbert, is not with us. He's actually at the March for Life in Harrisburg. But I am joined today with the one, the only, Tom <laughs> Holland. It is good to be back with you. I love it. I've been yeah. missing you, Tom. Oh, it's good to be here. We've got a great program today. We do. I, I know Rabbi Jack Zimmerman is going to be with us, and he has got a tremendous story of how he came to know Jesus, but also what God is doing through that ministry and his ministry now and what's going on in Israel. Yeah, I'm excited to talk with yeah. Rabbi Jack because there is so much that's going on in Israel right. and his story is so unique. I think that wow. our viewers are really gonna enjoy what we get to talk about Absolutely, today. Yeah. Um, you know, Jewish Voice Ministries is an organization of believers in Jesus committed to showing his love and sharing the life-changing message of the Messiah with Jewish people. Staff evangelist Rabbi Jack Zimmerman has been serving with JVM for 20 years and has a deep understanding of the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith. He joins us now to share his thoughts about all that's been happening in Israel. Rabbi Zimmerman, welcome to Unscripted welcome. Faith. Well, thank you. Good morning. It's great to be here in Pittsburgh and to meet you both. And I, and I have to tell you, being in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's been over 100 degrees, the last time I think we saw rain was during the Carter administration. <laughs> I'm loving this. I'm I'm absolutely loving this. So what a blessing, Tom and Angela, to meet you both. Uh, yeah, well, and you're joining us in Pittsburgh right now with unprecedented highs. Normally, yeah. you'd really be enjoying some fall weather, but, honey, it's hot. So you maybe brought Arizona with you. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I mean, here, what is it, like 80 degrees or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still over 109 in Arizona. Oh, so all things it. in perspective, it's 80, but after the show, I'm running to Walmart to get a parka. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to let you know. <laughs> well, Rabbi Jack, tell us about your story. How does a Jewish boy from, from New York City yes. uh, b begin to follow Jesus and have this worldwide ministry? Oh, my goodness. The short answer is very, very carefully. The longer <laughs> answer is, uh, so I, I was born in a Jewish home in the Holy Land. Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> right, Absolutely right. Absolutely been there. And uh, my parents growing up, they said, listen, we have three things we want you to do to honor us as a Jewish son. Go to Hebrew school. I did that. Second thing, have your bar mitzvah. I did that. They said, uh, third thing, uh, marry a Jewish girl. <laughs> Two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> and uh, met when I was 28, 29, this wonderful blonde-haired, blue-eyed Protestant girl from Northeast Philadelphia who went to a private Christian academy and was wow. raised in the Southern Baptist Church. <laughs> and the family was so not amused by that. And they said, listen, she believes in Jesus. You're Jewish. You don't. So whatever you do, get her to convert and come to your side. Don't go to the other side. And boom, here we are. <laughs> and uh, Sandy and I, her name is Sandy, we met and married on our first date. Uh, first date, we went out for some traditional Jewish food. That would be Italian. And uh, <laughs> during the meal, uh, she pointed at me and, and she said, Jack, we are getting married. And, and this was wow. on our first date. Wow. And I looked back at her and I said, okay, uh, to each other <laughs> or to <laughs> other right. people? Right, right. And she said, no, to each other. Three and a half months later, we were, and I had a plan that I was going to get her to forget all about this Jesus stuff. And of course, wow. she also had a plan. And guys, what happened, we're on our honeymoon and we're sitting on this beautiful beach in the Caribbean. And all of a sudden, my wife takes out of her handbag a Bible. And I'm not wow. saved at this point. And I'm thinking, you know, I didn't expect my wife to pull out a Bible on our honeymoon. And she said, who do your Jewish people believe the promised Messiah is? I said, he hasn't shown up yet. I said, well, what if I could show you some passages in your Bible that speak about the promised Messiah? I said, that's fine. You stay in my Bible, my Old Testament. Don't go on to your New Testament book. I don't want to hear anything about this Jesus. Uh, I just love the wow. honeymoon evangelism. Oh, here. my gosh. Oh, yeah. I mean, Tom, I, you would think you would have this conversation before all uh, you know, yeah, but the see, nuptials. She, but see, she was smart because like, we're on this desert. Well, not a desert island. That's Gilligan's Island. But we're on this island in the Caribbean. Where am I going? Right. And I'm being held captive. And I said, stay in my Bible. I don't want to hear this stuff about your Jesus. She said, fine. And she began to read. And here's what wow. she read. Part of it goes like this. For he grew up before him like a tender plant, a root, a shoot out of dry ground. He had no beauty to attract us to him, despised and rejected by men, pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, 
The guilt of our sins, the chastisement of our peace is on his shoulders and by his stripes we're healed. And she put the Bible down and looked at me and said, so? And I said, so you didn't listen to a word I said. I told you stay in my Bible. I don't want to hear this New Testament stuff about Jesus. She turned the Bible around and she said, Jack, I just read to you the first five verses of the 53rd chapter of Oh, the book of Isaiah. She said, Jack, wait a minute, Isaiah, isn't he on your team, Jack? And I said, well, yeah. And that led me on the search toward other, because there are some 300 Old Testament wow. messianic wow. prophecies. Four months later, I asked Jesus or Yeshua into my life, and here we are. And that was about, uh, you know, 36 years ago. Wow. I know it. I mean, that is powerful. This honeymoon evangelism is <laughs> yeah. like a really a, a powerful statement. Now, let me ask you this. As you were going through that process and even as you were dating her, were you kind of skeptical of like, what is, is this woman really going to try to convert me? Or were you just fully convinced I got her in the bag? She's becoming Jewish. Yeah, yeah. I was fully convinced uh, that, that this would be no problem for me. Yeah. <clears throat> and I said, you know, I'll, I'll get her to convert uh, and, and, and become Jewish and, and forget everything about this Jesus. So yeah, Angela, I said, this is in the bag, piece of cake. No way I'm going to quote unquote, go over to the other side. Well, how did your mom respond? I was going to say, yeah, I, I, initially and maybe down the line. Yeah. Well, it, you know, uh, there is a, a wonderful worship leader in the Messianic movement called Marty Getz. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how he came to faith and, and, you know, he said, and, and the stories are familiar, you know, your parents expect you, my son, like the doctor, my son, the accountant, my son, the lawyer, not my son, the evangelist. <laughs> and so initially my parents said, they were very upset. They said, well, you're not Jewish anymore. And I thought, well, wait a minute. It says Jewish on my birth certificate. And I said, why does it say that? Well, you know, because your mom and dad are Jewish. And then what I wanted to say was, oh, okay, so... I'm not Jewish because you guys aren't Jewish anymore, but we never got to that point. But, you know, um, years later, my mom came down to Phoenix. She lives in New York, and she came down to Phoenix to one of our congregational services. And I said, Mom, you don't have to come. It's Friday night. You know how we believe. She said, you know what? I'll show up. And she did. And at the end of the service, I saw a little tear coming down her eye. I said, Mom, what's that? She said, I just didn't know. And, and I understood where she was coming from because perception, her perception, anybody's perception is reality. And I was wondering in her mind, you know, were you thinking I was one of those, you know, Bahava Gita guys running around with daisies at LaGuardia Airport in New York? <laughs> and she said, well, this is real. This is a real faith in a real God. And so our, our, uh, you know, since that time, I've had the opportunity to share the good news with her. What's it like when a Jewish person comes to Jesus? I feel like it's a, a healing of the heart of God. Not that he needs to be healed, but you know what I mean, like a joy. I, I do, and, and it, Tom, eventually it is, but initially when that happens, the first thing that a Jewish people thinks is like, Okay, am I the only one who's doing this? Is there any other Jew? And there are many, many Jewish people across the world who've come to faith in Jesus. We estimate perhaps in the millions right now. And when we come to faith, people say, now you're a completed Jew. I'm like, well, I understand where you're coming from, but probably not the best term because you're insinuating that I was incomplete beforehand. I, though, am now a Jewish person who experiences my authentic Judaism in a greater way. I have never felt more mm -hmm. Jewish. And what greater Jewish thing for a Jew to do than believe in the greatest Jew who ever walked the face of the earth? Oh, absolutely. I just think about obviously the depth and the richness which with you understand the New Testament. Because yeah. hello, without Judaism, there is no New Testament. Amen. You know? so, Amen. It's beautiful. You know, uh, one of the things that it does for you is when you look at the scriptures now, you say, okay, I understand these scriptures in light of their Hebraic impact. Yeah. For example, let's take Matthew 5, 17, where Jesus said, I've not come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it. It. Traditional interpretation. Well, there's Jesus saying he didn't come to do away with the law at all points to him. Well, yeah, it does. But Matthew 5, 17 is not talking about that. In original Hebraic context, the terms abolish and fulfill meant to interpret something incorrectly. Fulfill meant to interpret it correctly. Jesus was speaking as a Jewish rabbi, basically saying to everybody, look, 
you know, you got five rabbis, you get 10 opinions, everybody's got their own <laughs> rabbi. If you go to speak to a rabbi, he'll give you this interpretation of a commandment, that interpretation of a commandment. How do you know who's right? Come to me as your rabbi because I haven't come to wrongly interpret the commandments. I have come to interpret them all correctly. Gives an entire new, well not new, very, very old and ancient definition of the scriptures so you see them in their original Hebraic culture and context. Oh, wow, wow. That, that is that powerful. Yeah. That is so powerful. Listen, we're going to have more with Rabbi Zimmerman in just a moment. But first, it's time to find out what's happening on this week's Trending Now. Pastor Greg Laurie is making news headlines again after 50,000 people showed up at his recent Harvest Crusade in California. Billy Hallowell wrote in an article for CBN that ultimately 3,500 people made a decision to follow Jesus during the event, with 1,500 more making the same decision while tuning in online. One week later, Laurie saw 2,000 people show up to get baptized during a separate baptism event. That baptism follows last year's Jesus Revolution baptism, which saw 4,500 people be immersed. In a 12-month span, we have baptized 6,500 people, Laurie said. And so to me, that's just remarkable. With so much chaos unfolding in culture, the preacher said he believes recent positive reactions to the Christian faith show there's a spiritual hunger among Generation Z and Millennials. With the preacher focusing his attention on helping people make a decision to follow Jesus and then build upon that relationship, the results are truly compelling. I'm Anna Schmidt, and this is Trending Now. I have to tell you, I can't hardly contain myself when I see a bunch of young people turn into Jesus. Yes. Listen, that's, that's where my life was. That's where a whole bunch of people, this is back in the 70s. I know it's a long time ago for you, but it was, <laughs> it was, it was like people were turning to Jesus. You know what, I, I gotta ask you about this, Rabbi. Yeah. What is it like um, when you see young people turning to Jesus? Because we see, we hear, oh, young people are leaving the church, and, but we're seeing a, a big group of young people turning to Jesus as well. This is amazing because it, it, let's say, counteracts against the argument of Generation Z that they're coming away from the faith. And I love seeing this. One of the churches that I preach at from time to time is a church where you've got hundreds and hundreds of upper high school and college students coming together yeah. and they are passionate, consecrating themselves to Jesus. So I, I, I think we shouldn't give up hope. I think there's a renewal of these folks coming into relationship with our Savior. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, it's beautiful when young people come to the Lord, when Jewish people come to the Lord, right? This is the Great Commission. Yes. This yeah. is the Great Commission. Yeah. So Rabbi Zimmerman, <laughs> you, you didn't start out as a rabbi. Oh, you goodness, were no. a comedian. Yes, <laughs> yes. How does a comedian become a rabbi? Well, you know, this is what I tell people. I say, like, you know, it, because, like, I mean, I head up a Messianic congregation in Phoenix, Arizona. And I want, at the end of each service, people to go and tell their friends, to say, listen, get deep spiritual teaching. He really knows the Bible, and he's got excellent credentials. Really? What seminary? He's a stand-up comedian, for crying out loud. <laughs> and and I, I, I think what that does is that just helps you you understand and see things in reality that other people don't see and 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 appreciate truth for what it is and want to dig deeper and really give folks the essence of what scripture has always said yeah it disarms people right that I humor so. does i love it i love it. if uh, i always pray when i speak i'm like lord don't let me be boring you know i, I, <laughs> oh my gosh. I should be praying for spiritual truth or something but <laughs> yeah. we don't want to be boring well, well can i share a great story with you i mean the best comedy is truth and some years ago i was in like the the jewish mecca of the United States, Philadelphia, Mississippi. There is such a place. <laughs> and there's a Piggly Wiggly supermarket. And I said, I've got to go because I love fried green tomatoes. And so <laughs> I walk into the place and Piggly Wiggly has the logo of a pig on every yes, product yes, they sell. Yes. So I'm walking down one of these aisles. I see this product. I start cracking up. The manager comes over to me and he says, sir, is everything okay? I said, yes. I said, but tell me something. I said, do you realize you're selling with a logo of a pig, a jar of Piggly Wiggly kosher dill pickles? <laughs> I'm thinking, what, did, did the marketing team not get together here and figure yeah. this one? What are we going to do to sell these kosher pickles to the Jews? How are we going to? Put the pig on the label. I, 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 just, I just thought that was great. That is so true. That's so funny. <laughs> that now, great. Rabbi, 
like th these are serious times though and I know that your humor has had to been such um, medicine like scripture says it does good like a medicine humor does or, or merry heart uh, what is it like as we're watching what's taking place even in Israel mm -hmm. how is it that you've been navigating these waters with your congregation and even for yourself thank you I appreciate that and and you know we're in a time right now where believers automatically and this is good Believers automatically, many say, well, I'm going to stand with Israel because I've got biblical precedent too. I've got Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless Israel, curse those who curse Israel. I've got Psalm 122, 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I've got Isaiah 40. Comfort, oh, comfort Israel, my people. So many believers can say, okay, we know what side to stand. We've got this. Biblically, they do. But have you noticed something? Even though you've got this, that doesn't necessarily counter the arguments and the false claims that are outside of scripture. How do we answer and respond to people who say, well, I want to talk about Israel committing genocide. I want to talk about Israel guilty of apartheid. I want to talk supposedly about Israel occupying Palestinian land and being a settler colonial state. How do believers respond to that? And that's where many believers say, you know, that I don't have a response to. That is why I've been traveling the world in the past year, going to churches and congregations and saying, guys, here are the responses you can give to those objections you're getting. And in fact, one of the reasons I'm so excited is that this coming Saturday, I'll be here in Pittsburgh at Messianic Congregation Yeshua Ben David with Rabbi Jeff Kipp, who's been on the show many oh, yeah. times. Yeah, and we're gonna go and I want people to come so that when you hear these false claims, you'll be able to respond to them once and for all because a lot of people who believe this stuff they don't know, they're simply ignorant. I, I, I'll give you an example. Yesterday I was having lunch with, with, with a Christian and they said, I don't understand, you know, why are so many innocent people being killed by Israel? I said, well, why do you assume they're being killed by Israel? Because that's, well, that's what we hear. I said, okay, guys, here's what happens. It's called propaganda. Israel has to attack the enemy. Israel drops leaflets telling right, innocent yeah. Palestinians, get out of harm's way. Yet when the attack happens, why are innocent Palestinians dying? Because Hamas operatives like Fatih Hamad and Sami Abu Zuri get on Palestinian television every day and say, you get back in your homes, get back in your places, because when you die, the world's going to blame Israel. And that's how it works. Yeah. And we've yeah. got to stop yeah. believing the lies. Well, let me ask you about your ministry. A Jewish voice and also, you know, just Messianic congregations and what's going on in Israel right now. Yep. How has it affected your ministry? Oh my goodness. You know, a Jewish voice ministries international. This is a ministry that understands the directive of Romans 1 16. Mm -hmm. Bring the gospel first to the Jews and also equally to the nations. Support and encourage the church in the Jewish background of the faith and bless Israel. And one of the ways that we're blessing Israel now is that when people give, let me tell you where the finances are going. We We've got folks in there at the Kibbutzim who have been displaced from places like Kifar Aza and Kibbutz Beeri. They lost everything, not just property, but the lives of, 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 of other family members. We've got IDF troops out there who are in need of supplies. When it was right. winter, many of them were cold. They yes. didn't have proper jackets right. and clothing. So we partner with 85 organizations on the ground in Israel. They're all sharing the gospel, by the way, and that's really important. And we're saying, listen, we're gonna send you finances that our partners send to us. You go bless those families. You make sure they have a roof over their head, food, clothing, whatever they need. Yeah. And let's make sure these IDF soldiers are equipped. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's powerful. I mean, yeah. to really be the hands and feet of Jesus, especially in those moments, I think declares the gospel message better than Amen. any message we could give. Rabbi Zimmerman, in the last few moments that we have here, what would you say, if you're looking at the world globally, you're looking at what's happening in America, what would you say is a word of encouragement to the body of believers in this hour? You bet. And these would be the words of, of Jesus in the Olivet Discourse when he talked about these types of things happening wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, etc. And how we're starting to see these things in our lifetime and people panic and they say, oh my gosh, look at all of these things. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Keep reading. Jesus says these things must happen happen. But let's also keep in mind that greater times are coming. We know the end of the book right. and the fact that we're yeah. seeing these things is a, a, a guarantee that God's promises are sure. And so is the assurance of those who believe spending eternity with him. 
I love that no matter what's happening around the world, there's a solidity in, in, yeah. in faith in Jesus Christ. That's right. That we can have that foundation no matter what, the world's falling apart, we know who we believe in. Isn't that wonderful, Tom? Yeah. It's Praise beautiful. the Lord. Well, Rabbi, we're going to actually ask you to stay put with us for just a few more minutes so that we can dive deep into what it means to share the gospel with the world. We'll be right back. With our thanks for your generous gift this month, request your 16-month Jewish Christian Victory Calendar when you give in support of Cornerstone Television Network. Inside the calendar, you'll discover stunning photos of sites in the land of Israel that have been vital to the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Plus, find encouragement through Scripture, reminding us of God's faithfulness in the midst of struggle. The 16-month Jewish Christian Victory Calendar features beautiful pictures of the Holy Land, room to track important dates, American and Jewish holidays, and a victory scripture for every month. Thank you in advance. Your partnership allows us to reach the lost through Christian television, provide our 24-7 prayer line, and support outreach to widows, orphans, and more. To request your calendar, call us at 888-665-4483 or give at ctvn.org slash donate. If you're just joining us, we have been having a powerful and entertaining conversation with Rabbi <laughs> Zimmerman. He has been full of life. And so, Rabbi, we wanted to ask you a question. Mm. You were evangelized on your honeymoon, okay? Uh, you oh, are yeah. on staff as the evangelist with the, the Jewish, uh, give it to me again, Jewish, 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 Jewish Ministries, Voice Ministries yeah. International. Yeah. How do you recommend we evangelize those who are skeptical about the faith? Great, great, great question. And I think a, a good place to start, first of all, find out, see if you can find out where the person is coming from. Look, yeah. when, when, a, you know, when a patient comes into the doctor's office, the doctor doesn't say this. All right, I want you to take these medications and go ahead, I'll see you in two months. The doctor first says, where does it hurt? Yes. And then prescribes. Let's find out where these people are spiritually. Number one, are they even rejecting in the first place? Why automatically mm -hmm. assume that somebody's going to reject your message? Mm -hmm. Always assume the positive. And I think a great entrance into that if you're not sure, is, is rather than saying, because I, I know many people try to share with me, and the first thing that they would say is, you know, are, are you saved? Are you washed in the blood? And I'm thinking, get away from me. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. But, but I think a great opening statement, that's, that's commonality, because look, we all have different opinions, but everybody agrees on one thing. One day, no matter who we are, no matter what label we wear, we're all out of here. And so what if we started a conversation with a person that we're interested maybe in leading spiritually and saying, look, we're all obviously leaving this place one day. When it's your time to go, where do you think you're going and why do you think that way? And it's a non-offensive question that opens yeah. the doors and the yeah. gateway to having a greater conversation of spiritual depth. You know, That's one really of the things that I always would do in that context is I would say, uh, you know, ask them questions and ask them, uh, you know, what their issue might be or whatever. And I would, then I would try to agree with them because usually yeah. they've got a point. There's a point there somewhere yeah. that you can say, you know, you've got, you're making a good point. But let me tell you uh, about the, the person I believe in, you know, so yes. it's yeah. some way rather than be adversarial, right? We're not going to get yes. anywhere being adversarial all the time. That's true. You know, it's, it, it's a great thing that you just said. I have never seen anyone argued, criticized, berated, or condemned into the kingdom of God. Come right. on. Right. That's true. Right. It's counter kingdom, in fact. That's right. I love that you said that too, that we, they just may not no, you know, even when you were sharing with your about your mother's story and her coming to your service and just that tear and her saying, "I didn't know," yeah. you know, there there's a sense of bringing them into an understanding or even just asking the questions. I think to get them thinking beyond their temporal moment right now, like, "Oh well, I haven't thought about where am I going to go when I die." I'm not thinking about dying on the daily basis, you know. <laughs> so it's really, really powerful. Is there anything that you feel like when you've had the opportunity to evangelize, which is really pretty much what you do, mm -hmm. that you've come into that really kind of stumped you. Wow. You know, initially, it was, uh, it was when uh, someone 
uh, initially said, well, if Jesus is your Messiah, well, you know, the Messiah is supposed to bring peace when he came. And when Jesus came, he didn't bring peace. I mean, Rome was in authority beforehand. Rome was in authority afterward. Uh, there was upheaval. There was rebellion. So there was no peace. So why would you believe that he is the Messiah? And when I was first a believer, that stumped me. And I started to question my faith. But then I realized something. The answer to that is in Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4. And it tells us there that, yeah, when the Messiah will come, nation will not war against nation. Swords will be beaten into plowshares there will be peace but when will that peace come it will come in the hebrew it says in the acharit hayamim in the very very end of days and then i said wait a minute when jesus came the first time it wasn't the very end of days yet so if he would have brought peace then it was too early that's why he's coming again right on time in the very end of days to bring it wow. just about a minute left let me ask you What's it like now? You've known Jesus for a while now. Yes. Uh, so, so have many of our viewers. What's it like now? This is absolutely amazing to, to be able to, to have and retain, of course, the, the Jewish background of my faith. And at the same time to understand that, that Christianity springs from a Jewish fountain. It's all one great story. The Old and the New Testament are all one book. Awesome. Yeah. So good. <laughs> That's good stuff. Rabbi Zimmerman, we love the positivity, the energy you bring, and I know you're making such a valuable impact for Jewish Voices Ministries. Is there one last word of encouragement you want to give us today? Yes. Please come on Saturday morning. <laughs> Yeshua Ben David Messianic Congregation here in Pittsburgh. I will be there, and, and let's talk about about how to answer these false claims against Israel because we really need to have a greater voice. Yes. Amen. Oh, that is fantastic. You know, I'm actually speaking at a men's meeting this Saturday morning, so I'm sorry I can't come. <laughs> oh, no. Tom, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I have a good excuse. What can yeah, I say? You, do. <laughs> you do. Well, Rabbi Zimmerman, thank you so much for being with us. We pray God's blessings over you and your ministry, and we pray Absolutely. peace truly to Israel. Thank you, and thanks for having me and Jewish Voice Ministries on Unscripted Faith as well as our TV show. Jonathan Burnus and Ezra Benjamin send their blessings and their love. Absolutely. Thank you That's so fantastic. much. Fantastic, and I would encourage everyone to go. Yes. <laughs> He's not coming to my meeting. <laughs> go to his meeting. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, Tom, we're thankful to have you today on Unscripted well, I'm Faith. Glad to be here. It's been fun. First yeah. time on this this uh, iteration of our program. Yeah, here. and you got to be with the wild and the crazy and I the know. skeptical. You, <laughs> yes. <laughs> And Rabbi Zimmerman, he's pretty That's fun, true. right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, we pray that today you found some hope and some Mary, like a medicine for your heart, that you would find in your steps as you go forward about your daily day tasks, you find the goodness of Jesus surrounding you, his peace filling you, and his joy pushing you on to greater moments. This is Unscripted Faith, and we pray you join us tomorrow for another one of these. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.